Welcome to On Listening. This is Daniel Rosen, your host. In this podcast series, we will be exploring many different dimensions of listening through interviews with a wide variety of guests to share their expertise and for us to listen to their wise words. Visit us at onlistening.net where you can subscribe to the show, ask me any question, suggest a guest, or suggest a topic. My guest today is Peggy Klein Platz, PhD. She's a full professor in the Uni- Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa, a certified sex therapist, sex therapy supervisor, and certified sex educator. She's the author of numerous articles and the book New Directions in Sex Therapy. She's most recently, for many, many years, been studying optimal sexual experiences. And it's exciting that she has a forthcoming book, Magnificent Sex. Welcome to the podcast, Peggy. Thank you for having me, Dan. I I have to disclose that I am uh, very nervous. I admire your work. I've met you personally and studied under you. I've learned a tremendous amount, and uh, I'm having that somatic experience of, I think they call it butterflies in the stomach or something like that. Ah, well, then we're both on the same page. (laughs) I'm nervous, too. I admire your questions and the way that you think. Well, that's just, that's very touching. I love hearing that. I know I know Peggy through the uh, American Association of Sex Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, where she's a quite a well-respected uh, clinician and researcher and educator, and most recently trained directly with her in studying uh, older adults who are having optimal sexual experiences. And while we may touch on that today, the the, the particular reason I was interested in Peggy for this uh, recording is that the way Peggy and experiential psychotherapists in the field from Albert Marr, I think I got his name right, is they listening is a little bit different or certainly very intense kind of listening. And I got very curious about how Peggy listens and how this school of experiential uh, is it is psych- experiential psychotherapy or psychology? It's experiential psychology in general and experiential psychotherapy, which was founded by Alvin Armar, and he would be horrified to have anybody call him anything other than Al. So <laughs> Almar. Almar. Fantastic. So tell us what tell us what is um listening from the Almar perspective and then your perspective? I was trained by the late Almar and was fortunate enough to have him as my mentor for 30 years. And he talked about the different levels of listening. And most of the time, What most psychotherapists are trained to do is what psychotherapists refer to as reflections. So you say something and I say more or less the same kind of thing back to you in slightly different words to make you feel understood. And Al would say, wearing his psychotherapy researcher hat, that that keeps you where you are. doesn't take you forward much. And... The big question for psychotherapists and psychotherapy researchers is how do you know that what you're hearing really is accurate? And so he talked about listening using three sets of data. One is if I let myself really try to live in your world, What happens inside of me? Three ways. What's happening in my body? So you describe having butterflies in your stomach, and I describe I have butterflies in my stomach. (laughs) Cool. 
we're on the same page. But let's say you're describing a horrible headache with throbbing on the left side of your head in your temple. The question is, can I listen in such a way that I also get that same horrible headache with the throbbing on the left side of my temple? So one goal would be to listen to you so fully, so deeply, so empathically that I start to feel in my body what's happening in yours. And that's one kind of experiential listening. And sometimes I'll just be watching some thriller on TV. And exactly when Hitchcock planned, I can feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck. It's just the way Hitchcock planned it. I mean, he was that much of a mastermind. Or sometimes, you know, you'll be with a really close friend who's describing some recent event and you start feeling yourself start to tear up. Those would all be examples of experiential listening where you're so much swept up in the moment that's being conveyed to you that it's as if it's happening to you. I love that description of listening, and I think I mostly think of listening as auditory. And what I gather from you is that while sound waves may travel to my ears, the listening part happens in my body. One aspect of the listening is uh, a growing sensation in my body that comes from what you've just told me. Is that right? Yeah. One way of listening to somebody is by paying attention to the sensations in your body as you let the other person's words come through you as if you're that person. You're so in tune with that other person. You're so attuned to the other person that you start feeling things in your body as if you're that person. So, I love old movies. If I'm watching Hitchcock, who was a master of creating suspense, there are moments where, just as Hitchcock planned it, I feel the hair standing up on the back of my neck. (laughs) Right, right. And then I know, I know that, yep, that psycho is just going to keep pounding that knife into Janet Lee's naked body standing in the shower and yeah no one's ever going to want to walk into a shower again after watching that scene you just feel yourself uh, tense and contract and every part of your body yeah yeah is responding in the moment fully even if it is a movie that was made in the 1950s okay what's the next level of listening The next way is by letting images come through you that are being described by the client. So your client is describing what it was like that day that he was at his father's funeral. And suddenly, as you're listening, there you are at that funeral. It's not your father's funeral. Your father's alive but it's the funeral of your client's father and it's being described by the client just enough so that you start to get images and you can see not just the rain coming down but you can feel the sleet you can hear the sound of the sleet hitting the saturated grass and all your imagery is imagery that comes from your client, but because you're listening with complete openness, you can see those images even more vividly than your client is willing to because it's so painful for the client. And what you bring to the experience is your willingness to welcome the pain. That's extraordinary. It's a... Uh what I associate to it is it almost sounds like a hypnotic trance in some sense. You know, I've heard 
that before. A lot of people say it's it's as if you're hypnotizing yourself into being virtually the other person. And that really fits for me. I, I mean, I'd studied hypnosis when I was just becoming a therapist, and it really does feel like at the beginning of each session, there's no more Peggy Kleinplatz left in the room. It's like I've become the other person because I'm letting that person's words evoke a whole world, which at that moment is at a graveyard. Yeah. But that becomes my whole world for that moment. So I noticed you switched from being you. Sorry. Yes, I, I, I thought you were done speaking for a sec. You, you switched from, uh, using the word client to uh, the word person. And it, I was curious to you, do you listen this way all the time or s- reserved for clinical experiences? That's a really tough question. I've asked myself that for a long time now. I would say that because I trained for two and a half years, before I first did this with others, I had to get really good at listening experientially, which is what we're talking about, this type of listening. And although I would say that I reserve it in particular for when I'm with clients, I can't help but get those feelings when I'm watching a movie. And I can't help but get those feelings when I'm talking with a friend who's speaking about anything really vividly. Or sometimes I'll be watching CNN and get really angry. (laughs) As if I were an American, and I'm not. So you, I'm I'm going to take the bait because I I know a little bit about the, what what the audience is going to hear. You referenced your two and a half years of training and you sort of snuck in that comment that before you saw any, I don't remember exactly what you said, before you saw somebody, before you saw a client... I think people are going to really appreciate the intensity of what experiential listening is when you describe the training of how Al taught you and others to do this. Yeah. I mean, this isn't, you know, you pick up the book that says, first you enter the therapy room and then you introduce yourself and then you do A and B and C in the following order, no matter who the client is. No, this is really specific to that person who's in the room. And it means that you have to be willing to let yourself and all your own personal baggage stay outside the room so that you can enter this room with this individual and enter fully into that person's world, letting go of your own values, your own judgments. All that's left is your own skill to be able to enter another person's world. In a nuts and bolts kind of way, tell us, uh, what the rigor of the t- the training actually was, at least at the beginning. It meant practicing the skills of experiential listening by listening to other people's tapes. Al Mar was not only the founder of experiential psychotherapy, he had the world's largest psychotherapy tape library. So if you could name any brilliant psychotherapist of the 20th century, he had their tapes. And we would listen to them over and over and over so that we could learn from what they did right and practice their skills and eventually became expert listeners. That would be the first stage of our learning process. And that, that I would say, was the hard part. Yeah, that was hundreds, if not thousands of hours before you ever were asked to sit with a client. Well, to be honest, I was the only person, um, I'm looking for the right word to describe myself. I'll be polite and say conscientious enough to spend two and a half years before the first time I was with a client. Most people did it much, much sooner than I did. Um but I wanted to make sure I had it right before the first time I was ever with someone who's actually paying to spend time with me. So I practiced for two and a half years. Most people didn't practice that long. I, uh, I got 
my butterflies came back a little bit. I think this is part of the reason that uh, it feels daunting to interview you, this the idea that you honed this instrument for, you practiced. I mean, if we do, unfortunately, the psychotherapy is more akin to the practice of medicine, where it should be more like the practice of music, where we spend the bulk of our time practicing without clients rather than with with when rather than working with patients and the daunting thing for me is the incredible amount of time you spent honing your instrument before you even played a note in public it's really remarkable thank you it reminds me of the sense of humility that I'm trying to bring to this project that or that I do bring but uh, of course when you're the host recording, you want to have some sense of, I know what I'm doing, but mostly it's a, it's a little bit threatening to think that I've, is it true? Is it possible that I've thought I've been doing this thing that people call listening and maybe I haven't really been doing it. uh, I know I want to get hierarchical. Maybe I haven't been doing it well, but I certainly haven't been doing it in uh, this fashion, which sounds really powerful. It is really powerful, and it's one reason why I would be reluctant to do it all the time, to return to your previous question. I don't know that everybody wants to have others listening to them at this level all the time. So I have spent so much time practicing at it that I'm pretty good at being able to do it when invited. But when I'm not invited... um, I'm generally not going to aim for that level of attunement in my ordinary conversations with people. But there are many different ways of listening. I mean, my understanding is that's part of what your show will be about. Yes. And one can be good at many different kinds of listening with different objectives in mind. The objective in practicing experiential psychotherapy really is to live in the other person's world. And that does require tuning into the other person's bodily sensations and images and feelings. That's number three, right? Feelings is number three. That's the third one. Feeling the emotions that the other person is feeling so intensely that they become your own for as long as you're living in that person's world. And of course, the neat thing is at the end of the session, that person gets to keep his or her feelings and you get to go back to being the person that you are at the end of the session. Well, people in the field talk about uh, vicarious trauma or you know, holding on to things after they leave the office. It, does this kind of listening, have you found, or does this kind of listening lead to inadvertently catching, holding, retaining things that you've tuned into? No, quite the opposite. In fact, I remember asking uh, Al Mar about that many, many years ago, and he said, think of it as the pause that refreshes, which was at the time uh, a tagline for some brand of coffee. I don't know, maybe Maxwell House. And because by the end of the session, the client has moved into a better space and the session doesn't end until the client has made that shift. You too get to move into a better space and that frees you up to letting go of where the client had been at the beginning of the session filled with pain to move on to a better space yourself by the end of the session. So both the therapist and the client have to have a sense of healing to finish the session successfully, for lack of a better word. Absolutely. And that's why our sessions don't run 55 minutes. They run until they're done, which is generally about an hour and a half. Yeah. 
yeah, it is counterintuitive that the the style of listening, the tunes you in, tiles you in tighter to the images, feelings, and bodily sensations of somebody is one that uh, lets you leave it more easily. It's a little counterintuitive to me. Yeah. It's like you go so deeply in some place that you've never been before that it's easy to, to enter it and then leave. Okay, so I like so the thing that's coming to my mind is that there's an element of risk, and to truly listen to somebody, whether you're you now I'll broaden it, whether you're using experiential psychotherapy listening techniques or a more uh, simple auditory technique, but to truly listen to somebody is, is not a value neutral. Is a, there's a risk involved in that that you're affected, that something happens to you, that you're armed. Hurt. Count on it. I mean. I've never been, as me, as Peggy Kleinplatz, uh, an 85-year-old man. I have during some sessions with 85-year-old male clients. And absolutely, there are things you're going to feel in your body when you're fairly old that aren't entirely pleasant. There are things that you're going to feel if you're living in the person's shoes who is sobbing at his father's funeral, even if your father's still alive, that make you aware, at least during those moments, of how powerful that level of love and therefore that level of loss can be. And you're allowing yourself not to be the traditional Bob Newhart uh, therapist who's running the therapy hour. You're allowing yourself to live so fully in somebody else's world that you risk feeling pain without the control of the ordinary separate therapist. You're allowing yourself to live so fully in somebody else's world that you feel what clients are most afraid of. Oh, if I let myself cry, I'm never going to stop. I'll be forlorn. Or the incest survivor's anger, who's saying, "No, I can't go there. If I if I get that angry, I'm I'm just going to I'm just going to I'm going to rip up your office." Uh If I ever let all the anger out, it's never going to stop. And that means that you too, as a therapist, are willing to let yourself feel things that scare other people even more fully than they do, even more intensely than they do, even more vividly than they do, which, of course, is what makes it safe for everybody to actually feel it. I'd like to ask you, Peggy, about uh, the research you've been doing with uh, Great Lovers, and I believe you have a book coming out, so I think there's a a whole section to talk about what you've done, what you've learned listening to older adults who are having super satisfying sex and uh, a little bit about your book. Well, thank you so much. Um, As you know, most sex researchers, and for that matter, most sex therapists seem to focus on what's bad and make it not so bad. And I don't know about you. I don't know a lot of people who want sex. that's not so bad. (laughs) <laughs> so my team started by listening to the words of people who are having magnificent sex. And we interviewed 75 people, and a large chunk of them were people over the age of 65 who'd been partnered with each other for at least 30 years and where the sex was getting better and better as they moved from their 60s into their 70s and even their 80s. I can tell you that the act of listening to them was one of the great blessings of my life. The people we interviewed were full of life. They were vivid, they were articulate, and this was true regardless of their jobs or their educational background. They were all people I would love 
to spend an afternoon with just chatting. So what did I learn from them? The first thing I learned was that great lovers are made and not born, which was really encouraging for not only my team, but I hope for everybody. If it looks in the movies like, you know, people to sort of swoop in with their magic tricks of sexual techniques and seductive maneuvers. No. Um, Extraordinary lovers. Don't just wake up one day with perfect sex lives. It's something that they acquire and enhance with effort over the course of a lifetime. And when we asked them what they had to do to reach the point where they began experiencing magnificent sex, they all laughed and said, well, the first thing I had to do was unlearn everything I thought I knew about sex and had learned growing up. That so many of the messages we acquire in our childhood, in our adolescence, are learned through silence. As a therapist, I'm sure you've noticed that when you take a history and you ask, you know, what did your parents teach you about sex? People say, my parents never told me anything. And my usual comeback is, so what did you learn through the silence? Exactly. That is uh, very common or or, or it's uh, something terrible. They learned yeah. terrible things about sex. And then in their adolescence and 20s and 30s, people are just trying to make sense of what is this thing called sex and how do I make it better? And eventually, starting in their 40s, most of our participants had to begin unlearning everything that put them into the box. So that starting in their mid-50s, they became extraordinary lovers, which means there's hope for all the rest of us. It certainly does. You know, these, these phrases that I've heard from you in training, uh, great lovers are made, not born. It's such a powerful statement uh, that I'm kind of intentionally repeating it, lest people think, wait, no, she, she said that backwards. No, she didn't say it backwards. <laughs> it's really true. And the idea is that, uh, kind of paraphrasing you, that there's something techniquey or there's tricks of the trade to learn uh, is just uh, just not true. The, the kind of sex that the people you interviewed, it's not that they got really good at having an orgasm or they got really good at providing a particular sensation. There's something much richer and deeper that's happening than performative standards that people might think are magnificent sex. No, there's a much higher level that people attained, and it was, I think, because they weren't achievement-oriented. They were oriented towards being authentically themselves in the moment, being true to themselves, being utterly absorbed in the moment, and at the same time being completely engaged and in sync with their partners. Are That's they, tricky. I mean, people can oh yeah. sort of be, you know, present during a yoga class, but being completely present within while also really in sync with another person, that's a set of skills which take effort to combine and a certain maturity. Our late colleague, colleague Gina Ogden, uh, was one of the earlier people to study the spiritual aspects of optimal sexual experiences and how women experience uh, transcendence. Yes, it's what she referred to as ecstasy. Yes. Would you say I that... Would you, yes, we all do. Would you say that uh, ecstasy is uh, what some of your magnificent lovers are achieving? It is. And I would just like to qualify in Gina Ogden's absence of that ecstasy needn't necessarily look like, well, this is an American audience, so I'll say the 4th of July. Um, it needn't all be fireworks. 
sometimes there can be an inner flame that's ignited where two people connect at such a deep level that two become one, that two sets of eyes see as one. It's not the stuff that we sex therapists write about. It is the stuff that the poets and the songwriters talk about so eloquently. We have mm-hmm. to learn from them. Yes. And then the, the other part that I think bears repeating a little bit is that people had to unlearn everything they learned. And that just is all the middle school scripts of first base and second base and all the ideas about uh, what I call the tyranny of reciprocity, that if you do something nice for me, I am kind of obligated to do something nice for you. And the tyranny. And of, only then do we get this light into home. Right, right. Yes. And uh, the uh, excessive focus on uh, climax and um, there's just so much to unlearn that it's almost unfair to say it because when when people, when you direct people to try to unlearn something, you're just creating a vacuum and they're hungry for the thing to replace it. A thing doesn't get erased until you give them something new. I couldn't agree more. So, I, I am pleased to say, given that you've just offered me this opening, that is what Magnificent Sex, our new book, talks about. And that is the vision that the extraordinary lovers we interviewed had for what makes sex magnificent, both what led to it and what it looks like when two people, or more as the case may be, meet in the flesh. And it's not about tips and tricks and techniques. It's not about gadgets. It's about vulnerability, authenticity, very deep levels of empathic communication, intimacy, and emotional risk-taking, trying new things out. And again, I'm not talking about techniques. It's more like exploring one another and oneself at a level that's deeper, higher, more expansive than one has ever gone before, which ultimately leads to transcendence and transformation. Boy, I'm sounding really touchy-feely. Well, so we're uh, talking about hot sex, <laughs> passionate sex, and more. <laughs> I, I think you're uh, trying to summarize a, a trajectory and give people flesh out the idea of what it is. What is magnificent sex? If you're going to learn something, what are you going to get? Well, okay, so now I'm going to have to like go in there, be vulnerable, play around, take a little responsibility for my own, what I feel, and take a lot of risks. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I mean, there's so if many you're places. you're doing it right, <clears throat> it should be a little scary. <laughs> right, and I think that uh, <clears throat> the uh, the fear is, uh, I think, uh, that if we start to really talk about this, then I'll be seen as the, uh, the unaccomplished person that I might really be, and you might not want me anymore. There's always that risk. That hey, life is short. <laughs> uh, I hope there's a hopeful side in that, though. That uh, can we say the majority? I don't know if we can really do that, but that if people do sort of a curated process with a, either with a great coach or a great therapist, or they or they have they really listen to each other, can is it safe to say that? In the majority of cases, it's going to work out if you take the plunge? Um, I'm wary of saying the majority of anything, but I can say that when two people are willing to go on a limb together and to support each other as they explore deeper, higher, 
the risk seems to be rewarded. Yeah, okay. So there's my opening. I think, <clears throat> look, here's one of, one of the things I imagine you've seen that I've seen is the, um, and this is the, it's a little bit more gendered. Maybe you'll find a difference there. But it, in my experience, it's often the woman is kind of leading the guy by the nose to come to <laughs> sex therapy. She wants to grow and change or the sex has been mediocre right from the beginning and he's petrified and reluctant and this it we, so many times again I'm speaking for you correct me if I'm wrong we're seeing a client and you just know that if you'd just seen them a couple months or years earlier the work would be so much easier and the success would be reaped with much less pain Well, you've said two things, and the second one I agree with very strongly. I mean, when patients walk into my office, they look so uncomfortable. It's horrible for them, that so much that they've delayed coming to my office as long yeah. as possible, and they look so unhappy to be in my office. I've come to tell them, you know, I, I know the number one person you never want to meet is the funeral director, <laughs> but I'm number two. Nobody wants to meet the sex therapist. It's <laughs> a good line, good line. But the first thing, so you're, you're, you're less sure about the gender dynamic there. Well, I haven't studied that empirically. Certainly when it comes to extraordinary lovers, there are no differences between men right, and women. Right, right, So when it comes to lousy sex, sure, I think all the stereotypes about men and women probably hold, but I can't even say that empirically because I haven't, I haven't done that research. But when it comes to the highest level of erotic intimacy, no, there are no differences between men and women, the gay and straight, the consensually non-monogamous versus the monogamous, the able-bodied and the disabled. It's really cool. Um, once you're glowing in the dark, we all look alike. <laughs> I do like the, the way gender falls apart. I, I was talking about the uh, that couples, one person tends to be the catalyst for trying to change things. And if I'm going to sort of recommend anything is to try to listen, to, to not just try, to listen to your partner if they attempt to articulate to satisfaction with sex, yeah, that, that's that. that uh, it usually, if someone has said anything about dissatisfaction with sex, that's not the first time they thought it. They're, they're not revealing it till far down the road, and too often, the whatever defensive operations are just not wanting to believe it's true that one partner has the other partner is trying to get their attention and uh, maybe this podcast as we talk about listening will help people tune into their partner's needs a little more quickly because um, once people taste sexual dissatisfaction they get sometimes they get a real urgency about resolving that you're absolutely right um, they wait forever and then once they've decided you know it's got to be now. Right. That is so true. And real people don't change that way. So tell us a little, give us a, you listened to, you listened to these uh, extraordinary lovers. Is there an anecdote, a, um, a thing you heard that uh, uh, is a little less abstract and a little more concrete that uh, our audience might appreciate or... Maybe there isn't one on the tip of your tongue. In fairness, it's hard to just give anecdotes out of context. Uh -huh. And I should add that um, it was a former graduate student, Dana Menard, now Dr. Dana Menard, who conducted all these interviews with me. She is my co-author on the book. And... Every one of the interviews was mind-blowing for each of us. Right. Well, we could, you know, so I appreciate the comment about context. As we try to explore listening, I think context is enormous. 
what you know what how do we how, so how does someone start to have a conversation about improving their sex life or how does someone start to have a conversation about anything and your point to context you're saying dan well i need you know that's going to take some time to build a context for that conversation and i think that's really true we, we can't expect uh uh, people to listen carefully just out of the blue without a context it's like you know we're all we're all a little bit like that eight year old who's watching t v and uh mom or dad is shouting from behind you turn that off it's it's time for dinner you know we 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 need some kind of preparation to receive something and uh i talk about uh, i'm 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 i talk about talking about talking. Or I, you want to have a conversation with your partner, you have to talk about talking before you actually try to start that conversation. Beautiful. I couldn't agree more. So, excellent communication and vulnerability. <clears throat> uh, I think there's something they're listening, you know, we listen inside to that, right? Uh, uh, you talked about listening so deeply that you're sort of running a simulation in your head of what the client's doing. How do people how do people listen to something that's very frightening inside without getting overwhelmed? One of the messages that we're hearing is that it's important to listen not just to words, but to listen with your body. So think, for example, of the way you would touch if you were polishing furniture versus the way you would touch if you were trying to listen with your fingers as you were caressing a partner you love and a partner you love being with in bed. And correspondingly, think about the way your body stiffens when you're anticipating that the person walking into the room is your physician about to give you the flu shot (laughs) versus the way your body opens up when you know that the person who's about to touch you really likes you, cherishes you, and will touch you in such a way as to feel you and not only your skin. That's beautiful. Touching all the ways so as to penetrate you metaphorically through touch. And very often, we forget about that. We talk as if there are right ways to touch and right places to spot to touch, and we look for spots on each other's bodies, erogenous zones. And the reality is that if you're touching so as to feel and allowing yourself to be felt so as to be touched, then there's a great deal of listening and learning to be done just through the act of touching and being felt. Yeah, listening is a multi-sensory experience. Absolutely. Those are just beautiful uh, metaphors. So so tell us, are we... uh, This book, Magnificent Sex, do you know when it's uh, being released? And is is it just for therapists? Is it... Who's it for? This is my fifth book, but it's my first one that's intended for everybody. So it's being released on March 30th from Rutledge. And I'm very excited to see how my colleagues will respond, but also how anybody will respond who wants to enhance sexuality. Well, thank you so much. It's a gift. This is, I know this is a, a labor of love. It's, 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 how long have you been this research? It's 15, 20 years, is it? This is 15 years that our research team, the Optimal Sexual Experience Research Team at the University of Ottawa, has been at this. But for me, to be honest, it confirms a lot of my 
understanding of sexuality through over 30 years as a sex therapist. It's going to be a great, uh, a great gift. I can't wait to read it. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Peggy, for being a guest on the show. And thank you all for listening. And Peggy, you said it's an American, you made a comment, it's an American audience. Hey, listen, I, I, I now, uh, I, I knight you, my Canadian uh, recruiter. You, I, you do your best to bring more Canadians to the Listen podcast than, uh, than uh, your Southern neighbors. And I'll be very, very happy. Count on it. Thank you so much for having me on. And that concludes another episode of On Listening. Again, I encourage you to visit our website, onlistening.net, and subscribe to the show. Send an email with a question, recommend a guest, recommend a topic, ask me a question. Be happy to respond. As always, or at least for now, On Listening is without commercials. I hope to continue it that way simply for the joy of recording this. Thank you.